Welcome, everyone. I'm so excited to be here today with Jeff Tanner. Jeff is the Chief Commercial and Marketing Officer at Smuckers. He defines his mission as championing, nurturing, and enabling every element of brand building and driving growth within the organization. In his current role, Jeff oversees teams dedicated to supporting the consumer and customer experience across the commercial funnel. And because on this podcast, we also uh, talk about both career, uh, work, and personal life, I also just want to mention that Jeff is also a husband and father of two beautiful children. So welcome to the show, Jeff. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks for having me on. Yes, of course. Well, and I just want to say I was fortunate enough to work with Jeff in a prior life as a strategy consultant, and he was kind enough to speak with me here on the Sustainable Ambition podcast. And um, a lot because this topic act actually came up naturally in a conversation we were having. So, you know, as you can tell from his title, Jeff has had a successful business career. Um, what it doesn't tell you is that he also has a successful personal life. And he's been thinking about this idea of sustainable ambition in his own way. So I'm really excited to hear his thoughts together with all of you. Um, so to set the stage, Jeff, if it would be great if you can share for those listening a quick overview of your career. How did you get to where you are today? Um, yeah, I'll try to keep it, it brief. Um, so I, I, you can probably tell by the accent, or I think it's softening, but um, I grew up in, in New Zealand. And, um, you know, at a somewhat early age, realized that in a country of what was then 4 million people, you know, the, the opportunities were a little limited um, and just geographically where we are. Although I'll tell you, looking at how well they're dealing with COVID, I'm sometimes, you know, kind of wish I was there right now, to be honest. But um, And so relatively early on made the decision that I would probably leave New Zealand for a period. Um, you know, first came to the United States to actually play rugby at Penn State and really got um, really hooked on the U.S. I came back um, to New Zealand and uh, started my, my first job as a strategy consultant, which was great. It's just a good, great way to start your career. Um, got to live abroad a lot, different countries, and, you know, Africa, Middle East. Or whatever. But I, I kind of always thought that I wanted to get into business um, and came back to the United States, did an MBA at, at Duke and really wanted to get into um, consumer products, mostly because I, I guess all that I really knew back then is I loved brands and brand building, um, the creative aspect, the, <clears throat> the, uh, the, uh, the aspect of owning a business, running a business. Um, and got my first job at Heinz and, Sort of funny enough, I haven't actually left that, that company, even though we've been bought and sold. And Kathy, I know you and I have worked together on different iterations. But, you know, over the years, the, the, the business that I joined was, was sold to Del Monte Foods and then went uh, to private equity and then ultimately uh, purchased by the JM Smucker Company. Along the way, um, I've had different roles in brand management. And innovation, uh, more pure play marketing, and in my role right now is is um, I now just picked up responsibility in addition for sales. So I, it was always this notion that I wanted to work um, in an organization uh, for a company and you know have ownership for the business as opposed to a consultant, and very much guided by you know, a love of building brands um, and launching products and, you know, that really oriented and pointed me, you know, towards CPG, which I've, stayed, which I've subsequently stayed in. And then, you know, more recently, as that industry's, you know, in some respects, you know, gotten disrupted in, in some areas with e-commerce and the rise of digital it's been a continual learning curve for me to um, you know, stay on top of where, you know, of what it takes uh, to, to, to run a CPG company uh, in, 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 today's, in today's marketplace. And that 
has really gotten me to the to the position I'm in now, which is chief commercial and marketing officer, which is the stitching together of everything that is required to win with the consumer and 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 then through through the through to the customer, and you know the underlying digital technology required analytics AI insights and everything that powers that um, it's sort of gotten me you know to where I am now yeah that's great I mean it's pretty remarkable um, you're really talking about how you've lived through this transition of how the marketplace is changing and have evolved yourself and grown your career through those changes that are impacting the industry which is really you know, yeah I you have seen a couple of different people approach their career differently. I always wanted to try to pick up additional experiences. And, you know, a lot of people don't seem, they seem to, to want to stay, to stay where they are and, and climb up in that particular area. And I've always been motivated to try to seek out something that's very um, incremental or a very new experience and to bolt it on. Um, you know, and as I sit in the role I'm in now, you know, I've had responsibility leading brand marketing, innovation, digital, insights, e-commerce, sales. Um, I mean, you know, sort of across the board, I've had those experiences and it was very intentional to, to try to seek out those leadership experiences and usually, you know, put me out of the, from the frying pan into the fire in some respects. But, you know, as I sit in this role today, I, I, it's, it's certainly an advantage having worked in all of the different areas that, you know, would constitute the commercial uh, funnel or model of organization. Yeah, so you're well positioned having had all of those experiences. If, if I'm remembering correctly, Jeff, uh, I believe you had an early ambition that fueled your career and kind of put you you on this path. And you sh shared how you had this uh, love of building brands and, you know, that led you to CPG. I'm wondering if you can share a little bit more at all about like your early ambitions. Like, did you have a sense of where you wanted to be going in your career and at what level you wanted to get, you know, or have your ambitions changed uh, over time as you've progressed in your career? I think that the overall ambition, Kathy, hasn't really changed a lot. Um, you know, I still aspire, um, and I don't know if it'll happen or not, but, you know, to potentially um, run, you know, a, a largest organization. Um, I think what has changed, though, is the time frame. You know, so I'm now in my mid-40s. I'm in no rush to do that, whereas that I probably wouldn't have said that 10 years ago, that I wasn't in a rush, you know. Um, 10 years ago, I probably would have picked the shortest path to wherever that was. I think as I sit here today for a couple of reasons, one, um, I'm not sure that the shortest path is going to equip you to be successful in that role. You know, you don't know what you don't know. And I've certainly um, fallen into that trap many times. But, but also on the flip side, I think what it takes to, to have one of those jobs, you know, it's pretty hard to get away from the fact that they're all consuming. You know, I, I don't know how you shortcut jobs like that. And I'm not saying I'm shortcutting the job I'm in right now, but, you know, I've got two little kids and I, I don't want to miss that, um, this part of their life. And so what has changed, so the North Star hasn't really changed. What has changed is the time, uh, you know, the, 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 the speed, much, much more sort of conscious that I'm in no rush like I used to be. It's really interesting. One of the things I think about with regard to sustainable ambition is this idea of pacing. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because, you know, I think for most women, they probably get this sense, right? If they have children, there's going to be this element of pacing to how they 
uh, need to function in, in their career. And I, you know, Cheryl Sandberg says like, lean in, I get it. Um, but there's some realities to exactly what you're just describing, Jeff. And I'm kind of curious, since I am talking to a um, person who I know is an involved father and is also a successful male executive, like, I'd, I'd love to ask you, how do you balance work and family life? Well, I can tell you, you know, so I, you and I were chatting prior to this, you know, I was diagnosed with COVID. So here I am, you know, having gone through, you know, it's not a pleasant experience, but one of the silver linings of this pandemic has been um, how much additional time I can spend with the kids. So it's probably worth noting that, um, Kathy, because not just, that's a bit of a statement of the obvious, um, but I think that the pandemic has shown that a lot of the travel that perhaps we were taking for business is not needed. And I, I think that that will be a lasting outcome of this pandemic, which is just a much higher bar on, on travel. And, and, and because I'm, you know, part of my role is hitting up sales, I was traveling a lot. So um, I think moving forward, actually, this will be one of the silver linings of the pandemic, which is work-life balance will be um, more attainable. But, you know, to answer your question, uh, you have to make it a priority. Again, statement of the obvious, but, you know, to give you an example of how I do that, I multitask a lot in meetings. And I've had a lot of feedback on that, not always positive. But if I don't multitask, then I'll come home at 6 or 6.30 and have two hours of email to clean up. And so I am militant about that. I mean, nothing would stop me um, doing that because the trade-off is the two hours that you have with your kids go out the window. And so... I think you have to be militant about protecting that time on the one hand, but on the other hand, you can't just assume it's, you're not going to get piled up, you know, with, with things to do, particularly if you're in a lot of meetings. So for me, it's, it's um, relatively sacrosanct, which is I'm not going to give up this time with the kids, particularly when they're young. Um, and so that's just an example. I think you, you just have to say that's the number one priority and then do whatever it takes to, to protect that as opposed to trying, you know, hoping that, you know, you'll, you'll, you won't have to make tough decisions, you know, in order to protect that. You, you do. You have no choice. And it's almost in saying that you're, you actually do, I talk about people around their time, they do have choice. You, you are cho choosing to prioritize your children and to protect that time. And you're willing to, it sounds like, you know, maybe take a little flack from others about multitasking in a meeting. But my guess is, as we all know how meetings go, that there's plenty of downtime in meetings for that to be possible. Um, yeah. So my, my, my suspicion is that um, you're able to still be present in the moments you're able, you, you're needed to be present in those meetings uh, in order to then be able to not have a pile up of emails when you get home. Yeah. I mean, I know I can do a better job of, of being more present when I, you know, need to be, but I remember, you know, even, Five years ago, it was pretty unusual for someone to sit in a meeting and put their laptop up. Yes. You know. Um, but now it's gotten more commonplace. And not, not everyone's going to agree with me that that's a good thing. But I think you're spot on. If you think about a meeting, and particularly if you're at a senior level, you know, you're not having to go deep on every issue all the time. Um, and so you can switch tasks, I think, relatively easily. You know, another thing that I do is, so I also prioritize my health. Um, and it's kind of a joke at, at work, but I, um, 
I do a lot of reading on an elliptical machine. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's people know it. And, you know, I, I will read through um, pages and pages and decks and everything I need to read, I will do it on an elliptical machine. You know, my uncle was a CEO of, I think it was the largest company in New Zealand at the time. And I used to go around to their house. We were really close. And I would watch him sit in his chair and not move. And he would read all Sunday. And then he had to stop work because he has his health and a bad back. And I'm like, I'm not going to follow that example. So I, you know, again, it's just another um, very intentional thing that I do to try to find time. You know, I'll do it when I'm working out. Again, usually in service of trying to protect those couple of hours with the kids every day. Yeah, that's great. I'm I'm curious, you know, so you said one of the things that shifted since, you know, your ambition hasn't changed, but just like perhaps the timing of that has changed in terms of what your expectations might have been. Um, I'm surprised at this point in your career with regard to how you think about work and personal life, if there are any other things that's kind of, that have surprised you, you know, like once you've gotten to this level, has, have there been surprises about how you're thinking about managing both your professional and personal life beyond what you've already shared? I think that, and this is what you and I talked about, I think what happens when you get and look I'm not I'm look I'm 46 years old so I I don't know if it's mid 40 whatever but I think at some point the job does start to become more of a job and that that's kind of natural I think I mean I think in your in your 20s you you know you're just you're just having fun in your 30s you're you're pretty you know driven and you're um, certainly I was, you know, very driven in my thirties and through the forties. By the time you get to where I'm at right now, you know, it's, it's not as new as it was. And, um, it uh, becomes, I think a bit more of a job. And then you find yourself saying, okay, well, that's probably not un- unexpected. How am I going to sustain this if I'm starting to feel like this now? Right. I think that's the, well, you're spot on, Kathy, in identifying something that it's not really talked about, honestly. Um, and what I have found myself doing, a little bit was inspired by reading a Peter Drucker book, which is just brilliant. I had always thought that, you know, you work, 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 then you retire, and then you do the things you enjoy, right? And so it was it, it's sort of sequence like that. I now think that that doesn't make any sense (laughs) because I'm not sure that, you know, there's enough. um, I think in order for this to be sustainable, you need, I need to pull some of those things into the now, right? Some things that I may have done, you know, I thought about doing when I was retired. And I think, and I might be wrong, but I have this hypothesis that if I can, pull some of those things into the now, I'll have more balance and I think I'll enjoy the whole a lot more and I'll be able to just keep going for much, much longer. And frankly, I just think I'll be happier. And so there's some things, so as one example, and and you and I have talked about it, um, you know, I always, you know, dreamed of being a a rock star and obviously that didn't happen, but... um, (laughs) Yet. But one of the things, yeah, well, you know, you never know. You you really, (laughs) um, but so I play out in different bars and restaurants with a friend of mine who's a full time musician. And during COVID, I'm like, you know what? We should should work on that album that we were going to do at some point in the future, pulled it forward. And um, we'll be, you know, releasing something in the spring. And it's, it's it's very energizing. Would I want to do it full time for a job? Probably not, because it probably just start to feel like a job, right? Um, but by pulling it forward, you know, I, I think it's, it gives me energy, and um, I think it also has some spillover effects into the day job too. I think it it makes you more, in this instance, more more creative. I certainly played for our organization, uh, played some concerts for them. 
um, makes you probably a little more human. The point being that um, this notion of like work, 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 retire, then go do so. I, I, I just think I, I'm just now questioning whether that makes any sense and, the, and questioning whether, you know, pull some of those things forward and start working on them now. Um, I just think it's going to keep you healthier, happier, longer, you know, both in your day job and just in, in general. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I'm curious, what's the Peter Drucker book that you were reading that inspired you to read? It's things? a little book. It's called, um, it's, a, it's, it's like a little mini book. It, it, you know, it's tiny. Um, it's called On Managing Yourself. And there's a chapter in there called Your Second Act. Are you familiar with that? I am, you know, just recently HBR re reposted a summary of it. I, I haven't read the book, but the summary oh. of the article is great. And yes, so I know a little bit about what you're going to describe. Yeah, it just, it, it, it really hit me hard. And, and you know, it's funny, I, I read that book when I was 45 and there, <laughs> that's the age that, that he references in the article. Um, and he said, now it's a, it's a slight different twist than what I just talked about, but he says, um, he falsely predicted all these people coming back into the workforce when they retired. So most people would retire historically because they were, you know, tired, um, manual labor. But now they retire because they're bored. And, and, and that's, you know, I think where you're spot on with this podcast and this effort, you know, you're, you're, you're getting after, which is sustainable ambition. And, but what he said is that what he found is that if, if people haven't started their second act well into their first act, they won't have a second act. Um, and he said, if you haven't really got it going by your mid forties, you know, you might be, you know, running, running it a bit tight. And, and that really hit me. And, and that was part of the, I guess, inspiration for me for thinking about some of these things a little differently. Like another example, um, one of my ultimate dreams is, is to, uh, is to produce a musical on Broadway. And, and look, is that going to happen? I don't know. <laughs> Very low probability. But it's a dream. And in, initially, you know, even as recently as a couple of years ago, um, Catherine, my wife, and I said, well, you know what, when I retire, we'll, we'll go to New York for a year and we'll, we'll, we'll try to do it. Now we're talking about, well, why, you know, why wouldn't we, why wouldn't we try it now? You know, she's a, 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 a mom, but, you know, she, um, she can free an hour or two, you know, to get it going and, and, and we'll see. And I, and I find that incredibly energizing. Um, but to Peter Drucker's point, you know, get it started now, you know, not when you're 60, it's too late. And I, I there's something in that, um, something really, really powerful in that. What are you noticing that's different for you as you've added some of these things into your life? I mean, you said, you know, it spills over into the work world too, your creativity, et cetera. But, and you said, you know, generally you've, you're happier, right? Um, are there any other benefits that you're noticing now by having added these things into your life and starting to craft them into your kind of way of being now? Um, yeah, no, there's, there's several. So, you know, aside from just being happier, um, not that I was unhappy. It's just, it's just, it's just exciting to do some of these things. Um, you know, in my job, I, I, I think I have 600 folks on my team and, you know, I don't get to connect with them and particularly in COVID. I mean, you know, um, that's very difficult to get, yeah, but when I'm playing, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm connected to them in, in, a, in a very unique way, um, you know, and I think that's uh, really important, you know, in, in, in any situation. But if, if, if you're leading teams, you, you have to connect with them. And the larger the team, the more difficult that is to do it one-on-one. -on -one. But I think music is, for me, a way of doing that. Um, I also have a, a coach who really believes, and I, I do too, that creativity, you know, if you're exercising your creative part of your brain in one area, it's going to be better in another. And I honestly believe that. Um, it's no different than muscles, right? And so 
that's another benefit. The other benefit is that what I found is, you know, I can go to the piano for 30 minutes and it's like I've just like had a massage and, you know, like chilled out for five hours, you know, and it's like my head's clear. And um, that's a huge benefit as well. So I, th that's why this whole notion of, of, you know, bringing it all together now as opposed to just viewing it as a sequence, I think is a, is a really powerful concept. I really do. Yeah, I think that's, that's great. I mean, one of the things that as you're describing that too, um, it brings up for me, we were talking before about the ideas like, is it about work-life balance? Or I've been starting to play with this idea of, is it really actually about work-life resilience? Like, mm -hmm. how do you actually build in some because I, I just don't think there's such a thing as balance. <laughs> balance. No. Like there might be a moment in time when you have balance, but the reality yeah. is there are times in your career where you you have to dig in, right? Or yeah. there's times when you're like, you know what? I, I My personal life needs some attention. And of course, I'm going to keep doing what I need to do at work. But, you know, so I just think balance is the wrong goal. But also as I'm hearing you describe these things and even what you were just sharing around like, by going and playing the piano for 30 minutes, like you shift your energy, you shift your mindset, um, as well as building these other neural pathways that are feeding creativity throughout your life and extending Yeah, beyond. I think that's right. I mean, I, the balance is such a strange word. I mean, I, I don't really know what it means because you're right. I mean, it, everything's a point in time and you're right. Sometimes you've got to dig in. I had to dig in a lot this summer, actually. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other benefit of it, um, and this may be the largest benefit, has been what the kids see in me, right? I mean, it's a little stereotypical, but, you know, I was, my dad worked, <laughs> you know? <laughs> he came home and then he worked and then he played golf. Um, but you know, I, my kids, if I think about how they see me, you know, I, I mean, I, I try to, they, they now see me, I think doing these things that are very different and I think that's good for them, um, as well. I mean, good for their own exposure to stuff, but also good in, in terms of our relationship and, um, you know, I just think it brings everyone closer together and connects in a way that is very different than certainly the way I interacted with my dad, right? It was very traditional. He worked all the time, workaholic, actually. Um, so I think that's an added benefit. But you're right, the notion of a balance implies that, you know, you should be in search of balance. I think resilience is good. It's a good it's a good term. I, I you know, I, I think it all combines together to just produce something that's greater than the sum of the parts. I don't know how what word that would be. Yeah, I know you were you were playing with the concept and you're often good at coming up with ways of naming things. I was curious if you had come up with something better. Yeah, than not that. yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just I just think the sum of the parts is greater. You know. Um, so whatever this but that's but but that's the concept. The the, the one thing I think you've got to be careful of um is knowing that at times you know let's be honest the priority is the day job and when you need to let the other stuff take a back seat mm. um and just being really intentional about that and being cool with it i mean that's that you know that's 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 job one that's what people are paying you to do and that's what people are counting on you to do, you know? Um, and so knowing, you know, there will be a time when that has to absolutely dominate and just to let that happen. That's okay. Yep. See, I appreciate that too. Just like really, cause when I talk about sustainable ambition, it's not to say that you're never going to work hard. There yeah. are going to be times when that's going to be necessary but it's also knowing that uh, you can counterbalance that at other times and to just be really conscientious and thoughtful about it. 
So. Yeah, you know, you're reminding me of a guy that you know, um, Rocco Papalia, uh, mm. who who gave me something that I think is literally worthy of a TED talk. He gave me some advice years ago. This is a oh gosh, this would be ten years ago. So Rocco, I think, was ex an ex ex Pepsi uh, Frito uh, R and D lead, and he gave me like this advice which is absolutely brilliant because I think it may be un it may underpin some of this stuff he said okay so what he was told to do and this is going back some years was someone told him to get a piece of paper on one side write a list of the things he enjoys doing on the other side write a list of the things he doesn't like doing go to the list of stuff he doesn't like doing outsource it all like throw money at it okay and then with the time that you've saved, spend half of it on the list on the left of the like, and throw the other half into work. And I always thought there was something very insightful about that because it sort of, it, it was very, yes, you know, do more of the things you like, but be willing to throw money at or do things differently to get that stuff off your plate. And uh, if you do that, even throwing money at it, it'll pay back, right? Because you'll be more successful in your career and you'll be happier. I always thought that was an interesting, I mean, very sort of equation way to look at it. But mm -hmm. um, I've certainly thrown some money at, you know, to get stuff off um, and, you know, invested some money in things I like doing. Um, you know, that's, 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 that's part of it as well, as well, right? I think, I think you have to be willing to commit to it. Yeah. And really that's the part of right effort that I think of talk about with regard to sustainable ambition and really being thoughtful about how yeah. you're managing your time, productivity, energy resources. So that's a very wise. I mean, another example I'll give you, uh, I schedule uh, phone calls, you know, it's pre COVID on every commute, mm -hmm. every single one is scheduled. And so in, in doing that, 40 minute commute each way, so, so there's 80 minutes that has now become available to use, right? Again, all in service of just being as ruthless with my time as I can um, in order to free up time for the kids and to invest into these other endeavors. Yeah. One thing I wanted to go back to, Jeff, actually, um, as you're even just describing that is, um, but I wanted to go back to the idea that even, you know, you're, the way that you're bringing these things into your life, like you're being a part of a band and playing music, it's very visible to the organization at Smuckers. And it's, I think it's unusual, right? We're having this conversation and we're saying people don't talk about this enough. And you were talking about how it's powerful for your children to be seeing you do do this and, and model this behavior. I'm curious if you hear any feedback internally within the organization, because I think one thing that I need to dig more into is kind of how do organizations support people in achieving sustainable ambition? So I'm curious how your modeling of this behavior, how it's landing within the organization at Smuckers. Yeah, it's it's a good. I mean, I if you think about David Solomon, who's the CEO of Goldman Sachs, you know, a very well known DJ, and you know he um, really makes a big deal out of that um, for for the same reasons I've probably I've talked about. You know, he loves doing it. It's a way to connect. My boss, Mark Smucker, is also a DJ, um, and you know, he plays gigs as well. So I'm very fortunate to, and Mark and David know each other. Just, I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate to work in an organization that um, not just, you know, says it's okay, but really I think says, you know, it's great and we want to encourage it. Um, I also believe, though, that um, people want to work for people and they want to work for real people. <laughs> Um, and, uh, they want to, they want to see you for who you are. And, you know, I think bringing that to work is 
honestly so fundamental to being a leader today, particularly with um, millennial younger consumers. You know, I have this joke that John Mark and I joke about it a lot. I've, I've learned a lot of that at Smucker. Um, it's, you know, they really value being real. You know, Tim Smucker, Richard Smucker, just the most genuine people you'll ever meet, says Mark. And, and I will say that, you know, previously, I, you know, I would get in the car in, 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 and in the car would, would, would jump this sort of joking, fun dad. And then by the time I got to work out, would jump, you know, Mr. Corporate, you know, I felt like I had to, you know, I was like, I put on some weird, like, change of clothes. And, um, and because I think that historically was how people thought they had to show up. Um, you know, it's an interesting for anyone who's listening to this to just, you know, how well do you know your boss and your boss's boss is people? I don't know. It's an interesting question. I believe that leaders want to follow real people. People want to follow real leaders, real people. And, and, that, and you should just bring your full self to work. And that includes putting these things on display. Not everyone's a musician. Not everyone can you know, do that kind of stuff or wants to. But um, I just think that's about what it takes to be a genuine, authentic leader is just be you. And I think that's part of it. I love that. It's one of the things I love best, actually, about also just building out of COVID is being able to see people in their home environments. I'm sure, you know, well, everyone's saying like no one's going back to an office ever. I, I don't disagree. I don't agree with that. But um, it's nice to see people in their home environments and just to recognize like you don't stop being a father when you walk inside no. the doors of Smuckers. You're still a no. father, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's funny. I think... Um, I watched people when we first started this experiment and, you know, this effort to contain this thing and people initially freaked out when their kids would pop up. And now it's just commonplace, you know, it's, it's, I just feel like this, we're just accelerating this journey from this relatively stiff, autocratic, you know, leader in an organization to being, you know, you're a mom, you're a dad, you have good days, you have bad days, you do stuff outside, you know what I mean? And it's, it's, it, it all shows up. And that's who people want to follow. Yeah. That's who people will trust, I think. Well said. Yes. And for anyone who wants to be a, a powerful leader today, it's, it's wise advice. Bring your whole self to work. So yeah. I'm going to transition, Jeff, just to, as we kind of get close to the end here, some rapid fire questions that mm -hmm. I'll just run through. Um, there's a handful of them, so yeah. we'll tick through them and then I'll close off with a couple of questions. So the first one is how do you do define success for yourself? Well, that's a good one. Gee, that's a big question, <laughs> Kathy. Um, I mean, you know, we've talked a lot about on the, the personal side and in resilience. Um, you know, I, I would say for me, as long as I've given everything that I wanted to do, the best shot I could possibly do. So we, I talked about wanting to write a musical. I'm going to take a shot. I'm probably going to fail. But I would define that as success. I would define failure as not even trying, you know. I, you know, professionally, you know, certainly at some point would like to consider running a, a larger organization. I'll take a shot. As long as I tried and did everything I could, I'll, 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 I'll be happy. What I don't want to do is look back and say, I never, I wish I, I never tried. You know, that's how I look at it. Yeah, right. What's the best career advice you've ever received? Maybe it's the one what Rocco shared, but. Um, I, I, I can't remember who said it, and I probably picked it up from just watching other people. But it's widen your tolerances. So every day, if you, there'll be things that you could take offense to every week, things that could upset you, things that didn't go your way that particular time. If you widen your tolerance and you have some patience, you know, you don't react to that email that got you a little frustrated or someone said something. It's just the nature of spending so much time with other people. These things are going to happen. Not everything's going to go your way. 
um, you know, it, uh, Sean Connolly, the CEO of Conagra, said to me, uh, have patience with your career. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't mean that you should be not ambitious. I, I, I define that to be um, just widen the tolerances, you know, and let it go and focus only on the stuff that's super important. And I, and I try, that's not easy to do all the time, but I certainly practice it very intentionally. Mm. Wise advice. On that, on that note of advice, like what advice would you give your 20 year old self? Um, you know, I, I, I would say <laughs> in your 20s, you could probably take some more risk, you know. I mean, I didn't start my own my own company. I I don't think that's going to happen. I wish I had tried, you know. You can try anything in your 20s. It doesn't really matter. You know, when you start having responsibility for others in particular and, you know, just whatever it needs to, I think the risk equation changes. But um, it's amazing. I, I just think, you know, I could try it. It didn't work. Boom, just get right back up. So I... That's what I wish I'd done. Yeah, that's great. How do you, I mean, you've mentioned some of these, but I'm going to ask it again, which is like, how do you like to take a break or pause? Um, it's, well, it's either an intense like Peloton 20 minute workout, which I, I can't stand. You know, I, I absolutely hate that machine, but I'll get off of it and boy, do I feel good. Um, or it's, um, putting on some music and or just playing it's um what is either of those are relatively immersive experiences and i as well like to do you've mentioned a couple of these too but i'll ask it again which is what's your best time saving or productivity tip oh yeah i mean do your reading while you're working out i mean it's a good one (laughs) um and uh the other one that I've started practicing a little bit, Kathy, is um, instead of responding over email, I'll pick up the phone. And boy, am I finding that those five-minute phone calls save a lot of email back and forth, um, particularly on stuff that's a bit more complex. So I've tried to I'm, – I'm trying that one on right now. Um, it, it removes all the possibilities of misinterpretation, didn't quite communicate it well in a written, you know what I mean? And that quick three, four minute phone call, um, so far I'm really liking that. And, I, and I'm, I'm going to, I think I'm going to double down on it. That's great. I love that. That reminds me, one of my favorite shows is The West Wing. And I've said like a goal would be to me to have, be able to have a five minute meeting. I think that's mm-hmm. great. And that's exactly what you just described. Powerful. Yeah. yeah. Um, the last one of the rapid fire is just what's one thing you can't live without? Um, right now, I cannot live without my daily harvest. Ah. So daily harvest is a, for those of you that you know what I'm talking about, but basically it's a smoothie that gets delivered to your house. It's frozen. Um, it's not cheap. I think it's like seven dollars a smoothie, but I do it every day. And I know that in that one act of having a daily harvest, I've covered my nutrition uh, essentials for the day. Uh, and I don't ever have to think about it ever again. So that, um, yeah, I hope that thing stays afloat because it's been fantastic. Yeah, that's great. Good plug for daily harvest. Wonderful. Well, Jeff, this has been so great to have this conversation with you. I've learned a lot and I hope everyone who's listening has as well. Um, just two final questions for you. One is just what's a final piece of advice you love to leave our listeners with? Um. But I think I think I would just double down on that Peter Drucker article. And for anyone that finds themselves in the, you know, with that, you know, a four or more in front of their age, um, now's the time to start thinking about the second act. And um, you don't have to be in a rush. You might be surprised that by virtue of your day job, 
it might actually help you, you know, get set up for that second act. But start planning for the second act now. I still see too many people, super smart, super successful who retire. And I say, oh, what are you going to do? They're like, I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. I'm like, what? You know, and I don't know. I can't stand golf, but I can't imagine that, you know, playing golf is capable of so much more and there's so much more impact you can have. So I, I would pull that forward now, right now, like start this week. That's great. Wonderful advice to end with. Uh, is there anything we can do for you, Jeff, or a way that people can find you or keep in touch around your music or anything like that? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe I'll take you up on that when we release this album. Um, uh, it's probably going to be going into the recording studio over Christmas and um, probably release it in the springtime. So maybe I'll take a rain check on that, Kathy, and send you the details of the of the website and, and the and the where, where people can where can find the music and maybe you know if I could yeah you know, I just want to. This, I'm doing this for me, but I'd love, I'd also love for people to, to listen to, to, you know, and, and maybe this makes people happy. Some of these tunes, that would be wonderful. Yeah, that sounds great. Well, we will definitely capture it in the show notes when it's available and we'll update that online um, once you. you have those details. Yeah, thank of you. course. Well, thank you again, Jeff. This has been great. I really appreciate having the chance to speak with you today. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. Great talk. All right. Yes. Find more inspiring interviews and get show notes for this episode at sustainableambition.com slash podcast. Make sure you don't miss an episode or my insider tips, guides, and tools by signing up for Sustainable Ambition Forum, my twice monthly newsletter. Sign up at sustainableambition.com slash subscribe. Thanks again for joining me. Speak with you next time.